Okay, so you guys can continue to introduce yourselves. I am going to welcome our presenters today. We are really excited that we have board members from our virtual Walden chapter here to talk to us about um, navigating online membership engagement. They are truly experts in doing this. That is how they run their chapter. So I hope this webinar will be really informative for you guys and we're super excited to have them share their expertise. And then if we just go to the, yep. Um, so just introducing who we have here. Um, so Walter, he is the founder of the Walden chapter, Walter McCollum, but he unfortunately is not here today, but um, he participates in the chapter and he's one of the, the great people doing this awesome virtual work. We also have Julie. Uh, Julie is the director of student organizations and planning at Walden. And uh, Julie lives in California and she's the chapter advisor of the Walden uh, virtual chapter. We also have Crystal Francis. She is a senior program analyst for the federal government. She graduated from Walden in 2018 with a PhD in public policy and administration. And she's currently the president of the Walden chapter. Uh, Dr. Francis resides in Baltimore, Maryland and is intending to apply to the Fulbright specialist program in the fall of 2020. Uh, we also have Tom. He's a core research faculty member um, in the PhD management program in the College of Management and Technology at Walden. He, uh, his scholarly expertise includes a uh, dissertation chair, second committee member, university research reviewer, lead core faculty for dissertation and research courses, member, mentor at residencies, and reviewer of the International Journal of Applied Management and Technology. He lives in California and serves as the vice president on the leadership board for Walden, uh, the Walden chapter. And he also intends to apply for a Fulbright Scholar Specialist program. We also have uh, Nadia. She is an instructor and consultant at the University of Calgary and resides in Canada. She is a member of the Walden chapter and the secretary on the board and recently applied for the 2020-2021 Fulbright Scholar Exchange to Georgetown University. Um, to uh, School of Public Policy to focus on research in learning data analytics, student agency, and political participation. And last but not least, we have uh, Janice, who currently serves as the Chapter Governance and Compliance Director for the vo Virtual Walden Chapter. Uh, Dr. Gravely has a PhD in Public Policy and Administration from Walden, specializing in terrorism, um, mediation, and peace. She is a retired military veteran currently residing in upstate New York. So with that, I'll turn it over to our lovely presenters. Thank you guys so much. Um, and let's get started. Awesome, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Olgren, and I'm currently the chapter advisor of Walden University's virtual Fulbright chapter. And it is a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to provide an introduction on um, the very first virtual Fulbright chapter. So um, just to tell you a little bit about our story, back in early 2019, Walden Dean of Student Affairs and Fulbright Scholar, Dr. Walter McCollum had approached the Fulbright Association and began the discussion of establishing um, the first virtual Fulbright chapter. And after those discussions and um, the realization that it, this could come to fruition, Walden officially partnered with the Fulbright Association in May of 2019. So we are just coming up a, um, to a year now. Um, so over the last year, we have learned many things as a virtual chapter and just wanted to take a moment to support all of you, um, um, other Fulbright Association chapters, um, you know, to talk to you about what we've learned and um, just share resources, tools, and expertise in operating a virtual organization during the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, as a chapter advisor, I support the chapter and board of directors to ensure that our um, chapter is in alignment with Walden's policies and processes, as well as Fulbright associations. Um, and as you know, the chapter that has operated virtually over the last year and now due to the situation that we're all experiencing with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, all of the Fulbright chapters have had some type or another, um, have had the experience of a new space and have had to adapt virtually in um, some way or another. So Dr. Crystal Francis, our president 
had, has designed and developed an engagement playbook to help our Fulbright chapters um, engage in an online environment that she will be talking about. So um, I, again, we really appreciate the opportunity to um, present to you today. We look forward to our discussion and answering any questions that you have. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Nadia Delanoy, our secretary, and turn it over to you, Dr. Delanoy. Thanks, Julie. Um, so part of what we talked about in, when Crystal um, came to us and asked about the playbook is just what does this look like from an online perspective and how can we use blended practices? Um, so that means those of you that are not online per se, but having the conversation around engagement. And so if you could think about it high level, um, you already have your participant engagement. You just need to maybe have a conversation around the medium or the vehicles in which you use. So for us, because we are virtual, it is integral that we are highly engaging, that we know exactly what our membership needs, wants, what they wanna to contribute to. And then also what does our virtual space provide us? So earlier we had talked to Shaz and Lisa and they had had a conversation around backgrounds for Zoom, multi-user, all the things that we need to understand in order to leverage those tools. So for us, part of our Engagement 101 is understanding the space, understanding what people need, uh, really pulling in our membership in order for them to take the lead and collaborate on our projects. And then also providing that time um, for multiple uh, meetings or frames for people living internationally or um, in our cases across the states uh, and Canada and then having that ability to look at our data, reinform our practice and engage. So it's not just about the online platform, it's about the feedback, uh, whether that's surveys or polls that we use and then also being able to operationalize that. So for us, we really did start this year with a robust strategy um, multi-tiered obviously for communications, project services, and all of the aspects that reflect the Fulbright mission and vision overlaid on the Walden mission and vision. So for us, when we created those strategy areas or points, um, we ensured that our board was engaging at all of those levels together, but also took a separate leadership. We then engaged with our membership to see who would want to contribute to it, and then um, talked about what are the feedback points that we're getting and then retargeting. So in, in many of our cases for us, for example, we um, engaged in LinkedIn, uh, have been looking at Facebook just because of our demographics, and then also re-establishing um, our raison d'etre, if you will. So the purpose for being, uh, why are we here? What do they need from us? And that is our primary focus. Um, as Crystal always talks about, if we don't fill that need or provide a value, then uh, really we're all for naught. So in our case, as with yours, uh, don't please don't look at this as some sort of um, absolutely alien approach. You already have your mission and vision. You now need to hopefully consider, and many of you have, what vehicles and mediums you can use on the online or blended way to leverage your existing services and I'll turn it to Crystal. Thank you, Dr. Nadia. So, you know, I know a lot of your organizations have um, had a lot of experience hosting just events in person, doing chapter management in person. And so with this whole COVID-19 epidemic, our whole uh, goal here is to give you some tangible takeaways of how you can transform your brick and mortar approach and convert it to uh, online engagement while we're all quarantining and sheltering in place so that you don't lose the retention and engagement of your man of your uh, chapter members while we're going through um, this pandemic and so what really works with online engagement um, platforms um, before you even like uh, Dr. Nadi was talking about before you even start thinking about platforms you want to make sure that every decision that you make is um, strategic and planned. So you want to document what your engagement strategy is going to be and then implement it. One of the things that um, I want to point out here on what works is the first thing you're going to want to do is develop some type of online community. And, and to simply put, it's a gathering place that your members can go to 
um, whether it's a Slack group, whether it's a Facebook group, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, you want to create what is called an online community. And you want that to be your designated place to engage members on a periodic basis. I want to point out the benefit of leveraging social media because social media can provide you with an online community that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, managed in real time. And so you, you're thinking about a platform to use. Number one, you want to take a poll from your membership to determine where is it that they already are. You're going to get higher engagement numbers when you're engaging on a platform that your members are already using because half the battle is getting them to, you know, download an app, figure out how to use it, take a poll to figure out what they're using. What we did, uh, a lot of our membership is, um, you know, online. And there were many platforms for us to choose from. As Dr. Nadia was talking about, we had a decision between Facebook and LinkedIn. We chose LinkedIn first because most of our members expressed that they would prefer to engage with us there because on LinkedIn, they're already branded professionally. I know some of us have our Facebook pages, which we kind of use for personal reasons. And we sometimes people don't want, to, want you to be their friend on Facebook because maybe they're posting things that um, they don't want everyone to see. But with the LinkedIn platform, it's already a professional platform. It allows them to be able to network across communities. And so we decided to leverage that uh, platform first. So that's where our designated online engagement spot is. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't engage um, via email. We also engage by uh, sending out a digital newsletter. But we wanted to create a space where members engage with us but also network engage with each other without without us having to press you know create an event or be live on the scene to manage um, that exchange and so some popular platforms to use are linkedin facebook twitter and instagram but just understand how those um vehicles are used instagram is more so of uh, pictures and videos so it's used primarily for marketing so if you want to engage your members in a uh, visual capacity, then consider LinkedIn. Facebook is more a, um, a, a platform where it's not very professional. I'm not going to say it's not professional, but people tend to let their hair down on Facebook. So if you want to create a platform where you can, and you can control interaction, if you want to create a platform where it's, um, it's not so... Um, business savvy at some place where people can literally build friendships then think about leveraging facebook we use again linkedin because it's the professional branding people um you know they have their resumes uploaded so we wanted to create a form where there can be not only information but um if people wanted to work with each other cross teams on research we just felt like linkedin was uh, a better platform and um the next thing that i want to talk about on the next slide is you know, um, why people actually um, engage online. So once you, def once you determine what platform you're gonna to wanna to use, you're gonna to have to make sure that your touch points and your engagement is robust. People have to, um, they wanna to come to you for something. So thing, if you're new at this, you, you don't have an online presence, you have to create what we call a, a online virtual or social media habit so when you're first starting out when you create your platform you're going to have to engage quite frequently to start that followership that was one because you already have your members email addresses so the first thing that you want to do once you determine what platform you want to want to use and you establish that platform you send out a blast and tell your uh, members how they can connect once they're connected to you on your online community, you are gonna to want to make sure that you're engaging in a diverse way to pique the interest of all members. So don't just use your online platform as a way to communicate information about when events are gonna be. Use it to literally engage. So if that's, um, and I'm gonna use some strategies that we use in, at the virtual uh, Walden chapter, we like to highlight our members. We like to tell stories about what amazing things that they're doing in the world um, to advance positive social change. So that's one uh, touch point. 
we do share information. So if we're going to have a virtual roundtable event, which is a speaker event that is leveraged um, virtually, we send out information about what kinds of topics do they want to hear so that they can feel like they're a part of the planning process. We also, when we are engaging as far as posts are concerned on social media, we try to utilize what I call a content calendar because we, we don't want to be boring. You, people are going to be um, coming to you. They're going to be following you for something. So you want to pique the interest of everyone. So we try to use a calendar to kind of leverage the types of information that we're going to share. And what that looks like is literally developing a target topic engagement topic to engage your members on on a daily basis on a weekly basis as when you're first starting out I, it's important to engage frequently because if you're only going to engage once a week on a new platform it's going to be hard for you to develop a followership that is going to be loyal to you meaning engaging back meaning liking and sharing and commenting on the posts that you put so you want to make sure that you are creating a calendar that is going to leverage the interests of all your members so if that's you know, a motivational Monday, maybe you're posting something on Monday. So if Crystal Francis needs an uplifting word to start off my uh, work week, I know I can go to my Fulbright Facebook page and get that motivational Monday quote to help me get through the week. Um, if it's, um, you know, Spotlight Wednesday, where I can go figure out what other amazing things people are doing in the world. If it's a trivia challenge on Tuesday, where you can get your uh, Fulbright members engaged on the history of Fulbright, or if it's um, Thursday, um, maybe you're posting information or updates about what's going on as far as program offers and grants or um, trending news. And then my favorite one, follow, we, I call it Follow Back Friday. It's very important that when people engage you, you engage them back. So if you don't follow your members back, it, it doesn't seem like a loyal connection. So it's going to take time. We recommend that you create a com We have a whole committee that's dedicated to um, internal and external engagement. So those are some um, takeaways there. Um, I will pass it on to Dr. Tom, who's going to talk a little bit about how to create a virtual experience and what works as far as events are concerned. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Francis, and welcome, everyone. We're so happy that you're here and privileged to share a little bit about what we do in a virtual environment to uh, really connect with our, our Fulbrighters. Uh, so when we look at a, a virtual experience, uh, I'd like you to kind of maybe do a little bit of a paradigm shift here and not realize that, hey, you know, this isn't possible. Uh, what we'd have to really think about is not canceling uh, in-person events, right, and hosting virtually, just like we're doing now. Uh, we have an opportunity to uh, kind of connect and, and build those relationships. And when we kind of see each other, uh, we have that opportunity to do so. Uh, a little bit of research to kind of share with uh, uh, Jiang uh, Ito uh, in the Journal of Neural Science. Uh, their research has shown a significant increase in the neural synchronization between the brains of two people during face-to-face, -face, but not during other types of communication. So really, what does that tell us? Uh, so when we're face to face and we can see and respond to other people's reactions, uh, like facial expressions, et cetera, uh, facilitators, as you connecting with your Fulbrighters, uh, have that then uh, chance to show that you really care. And by asking probing questions, you engage in critical thinking, you are involved in active listening. And with that, you seek to understand the audience's perspective and where they're coming from. And this is especially critical when you need people to adopt new behaviors, uh, advancing your goals as your chapter is moving forward. And especially in such times that as we're experiencing right now with the pandemic. So I'd like you to kind of consider uh, what that looks like. And when we think about digital communication tools, uh, here we are in Zoom today. And uh, if you were to meet with uh, your Fulbrighters and think that, well, you know, used to, we're used to doing table exercises when we're in person. Well, you can still do that in Zoom because you can cluster people together in breakout rooms virtually and they can chat back and forth just like we're seeing each other now. And then you can invite them back into a general session and you can reconvene and share and, and kind of learn and grow from that point on. So when we look at uh, Zoom, there's obviously Microsoft Teams, there's Skype for Business, Cisco WebEx, GoToMeeting, Slack. I mean, there's so many options out there and some kind of get started uh, free, right? Without any subscription. 
So we look at creating these online meetings and the applications of video conferencing. Uh, it's really kind of almost boundless. Uh, so I don't want you to feel that you're restricted and saying, hey, you know, I, I can't kind of pull off this face-to-face -face engagement because you really can in a controlled online environment. So that then transitions to really kind of think about what works for us. And what we found in the experience in creating engagement ideas is hosting happy hours, right? We're kind of seeing that uh, on TV now as well, right? If you're checking out TMZ or any of those other kind of CNN, everybody's kind of learning how and kind of figuring it out, finding their way. Uh, dance parties, uh, sip and paint, right? Uh, wine or your, your kind of favorite beverage and uh, kind of going through a little bit of creativity and people painting and just kind of having fun. Uh, trivia nights, talent shows, uh, all that is good. So you can still, again, think about facilitating your workshops and webinars and uh, with all the opportunities that are before us right now, it's really unprecedented where we can then reach out and help others. We can kind of think about how we can give back. And with that, uh, Think about personal growth and development and what you can do as Fulbrighters to share information and knowledge and skills with uh, other people uh, that you can help them improve their position, especially if they're transitioning in the marketplace for jobs and, and other career opportunities. Uh, so with that, uh, we look at uh, other opportunities to think about uh, building uh, team com camaraderie uh, and expressing yourself as leaders. And people then will uh, have an opportunity to really kind of connect and, and think about uh, different ways of doing so. So I'll turn it back over and uh, you'll hear a little bit more about uh, tracking metrics. And uh, well, please stay with us because uh, we've got a whole lot more to share with you. Thank you so much. So um, this is Crystal again. Um, Nadia, before you um, go to the tracking metrics, I just want to address some of the questions that were in the chat based on some of the slides we've covered so far. Really great, great questions here. Um, first, I wanna uh, thank Elizabeth for her question. She was talking about uh, one single platform. Ours are already on Facebook, but that may change as we um, gain younger members. How do we handle that? Engaging without an event, I thought we were required to hold events. So really good question, Elizabeth. So, you know, um, I'll, in, Someone also asked about the demographic of our uh, chapter. So we're very diverse. And um, we, have, um, we have Gen Xers, we have um, traditionalists, we have uh, baby boomers, we have millennials, I'm a millennial. Um, so we're really diverse with our chapter. That's why it's very important to collect data. You want data to inform the how. Um, and, and the what, what platform you're gonna use and how you're going to engage. Um, you don't have to have one single platform. Um, since we were first starting out, we decided to start off with one platform. So let's say, for example, you were already starting, you already have one platform, Facebook. Then you would wanna try to use a second platform. Um, like you said, you have um, younger members. How do you handle that? Again, you have to get the data, so get that feedback from your members, ask questions like, you know, how do you prefer to engage with us? What type of engagement um, activities do you want to see? Um, if you're thinking about uh, changing one of your uh, in-person events to a virtual event, maybe uh, collaborate with your board members to figure out what event was the most well attended and then transition that one into your virtual uh, space. But really, it's you're going if you're trying to manage this by yourself if you have more than one platform it's going to be difficult so get the members who are younger like you said you're going to be gaining younger members get them involved with assisting the chapter in this engagement strategy and coming up with some of the ideas that's one of the things that we did um we again use linkedin yeah so just a couple of things to piggyback on crystal um, it should not feel overwhelming. Uh, this was my dissertation was uh, big data and social media analytics and how that impacts leadership and management. So a lot of companies um, and nonprofits are evaluating how they're going to use it. So you could use two platforms. You could use Facebook primarily for community building, which most people do. And it's very, as Crystal said, laid back, a little bit more conversational in nature. And then if you do have millennials, you could use Instagram, again, talk to your people, but you just need to be clear on how you're using it. And so that communication piece and sharing with everyone your strategy. So if you're on Facebook and you're interchanging, so you're dialoguing with people, share that that's what you're doing on Facebook. If you're using Instagram to engage with the younger population, 
um, then share with them that you'll be pushing out communications and maybe not engaging in interaction on um, Instagram, but branding. And so it, there really needs to be that clarity of communication around what you're using and why. And one last thing, Crystal, sorry, but someone did put on that they're relaxing um, the proximity or engagement and that's happening in Canada as it in, is in the United States. And I think you're absolutely right. The one thing I would love to lightly challenge you on is just um, you have people in your um, chapters that live in the online world as well. And just because you're a face-to-face -face chapter doesn't mean you can't optimize your uh, digital presence as well. And you should uh, if you're trying to build a multi-layer participation um, and membership approach, because that's the world we live in, whether we like it or not, people are utilizing social media. Yeah, and just one more comment before you jump into the metrics. Also, once they start lifting the you quarantines, I, I think some people are gonna be hesitant and, and really picky about where they're going to engage after this. So I think it's gonna probably be a slow crawl back to normal. So you wanna also keep that in mind, you know, so it's very important to try to have uh, multiple mediums in which to engage. So um, Nadia take, will take away the metrics for us. So just on the metric side, as you would do in anything, you have your qualitative and your quantitative. Quantitative being in the back end of your platforms or on your own website. What are people uh, saying, clicking on, liking, commenting on? What's the content? What does it mean when they're commenting? What are the mes messages they're sharing? When you are um, soliciting stories for your newsletters, because many of you have those as I've seen, um, what are people reading? Are they reading the newsletter? Are they pulling it from the website? Um, are they commenting back to you? Provide those opportunities. And it doesn't matter if it's online or face-to-face, Everyone should be utilizing um, exit slips, um, polls, uh, any sort of survey mechanisms, again, to keep your data moving and being able to uh, show your followership that you're listening to them and you're being agile enough to communicate back. So from my perspective, and I won't read through all the points, from a data perspective, uh, really know what you're measuring, why you're measuring it, how it can inform your practice, and how then can you share certain data points with your membership so that they know that you hear them? Crystal, do you wanna continue with the rest? Yeah, um, and so someone asked a really good question um, about the uh, logistics. Would you speak more particularly to the logistical management of social media platform on a daily basis? Oh yes. So. Um, it, it depends. You can use uh, social media engagement tools like Hootsuite, H-O-O-T, Suite. Um, and what that looks like is if you have multiple social media platforms and you want to engage more than once a day, maybe you want to engage at the high points, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 3 p.m., and 6 p.m., then you want, might want to look at using some of um, Hootsuite's offerings, where if you have the free subscription, it'll allow you to subscribe and add up to three platforms that you can engage and you can schedule your engagement. So I uh, leverage social media sometimes for the government and we use Hootsuite. And so what we do is we plan out all of our posts a month prior. So I go into who we, I schedule my Twitter, my Instagram, and my Facebook based on the content that we've established in our strategy for the specific days, Monday through Friday, and post. Now, as far as the engagement piece, it really depends on how big your team is to handle the management part of it. Because you want to post, but if you also want to be a chapter that responds to comments, like Dr. Nadia was talking about earlier, you want to make sure that you have a team because it can get very busy if you have a lot of members. If you have over 500 members that are subscribed to your social media channels and, and they're commenting and you want to comment back on their comments, it's going to take a lot of work. So again, we encourage you to set up a committee and a, a digital engagement committee to help so one person is not doing this by themselves. One person can do it, but you don't, like Nadia said, you don't want it to be overwhelming. And so try to use tools, free tools like Hootsuite. If not, another strategy would be to 
uh, uh, break up your team and assign someone a social media channel. So uh, one person can manage your Facebook, another person can manage your Instagram, and then a third person can manage your LinkedIn. But literally, you're going to create the strategy that works for you for the size of your chapter and um, create that social media habit. That's really the logistic part is just planning and scheduling the engagement so that it, it, people um, know when you're going to be on and then it doesn't get out of hand. Um, any other questions about um, that piece before we move in? So I just wrote in chat, um, Crystal. Um the ways in which you can have your metric points. So if you're looking at participation as a metric point, engagement as a metric point, feedback as a metric point, then, then as all of us are very capable, unpack that for yourself. So if it was face to face and it was engagement, you would say how many people raised their hand or how many people contributed to the conversation or part, or I guess um, volunteered to participate in an event bring that up to uh, online medium, it's actually the exact same thing, except that it manifests into likes, reshares, reposts, following, et cetera. And we can certainly provide some resources if you want help on unpacking how to uh, choose your metrics, uh, evaluate your metrics, and then move it forward. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, and so we're going to move into um, the, the next slide, and this is just lit, a just brief tutorial on how to um, set up um, a meeting or an event in Zoom. Um, if you want more specific information, we I encourage you to go to Zoom's website, zoom.us. They have to, video tutorials. We're just going to walk through high level, and I want to thank Elaine for her question what level of subscription do you have for Zoom, webinar level or something higher um, than that to do the chat rooms? So um, if you use the free version of Zoom, it's um, gonna be limited. Um, the free version of Zoom will give you 40 minutes of uh, meeting time. And, um, you know, if the 40 minutes expires, there have been a lot of savvy workarounds people have done. Um, if, if you're having like a chapter uh, officers meeting, let's say you it goes over the 40 minutes or maybe you need an hour and a half, then what people are, have been doing with the free version of Zoom, they'll set up two meeting points. So when the one meeting expires because Zoom will kick you out, then you can log back into the second uh, session. But if you go up to the next level, it's $14.99 a month. You can have, um, I think, uh, up to 100 members. You can get some Zoom rooms, meaning if I break out, try to do breakout sessions, you can literally automatically have a, five people in this Zoom room, six people in this other room, and still be connected to the main session. So again, that, descript that the subscription level, um, the prices, and the features are on um, zoom.us. So go there to see what works for your chapter and your budget. But uh, we are using, I know I have my own personal uh, Zoom and I'm using the $14.99, which is the next level up, which allows me to have unlimited meeting time and up to 100 people on at once. Um, so if you do not have Zoom, the first thing you want to do, and we're just using Zoom as an example. Um, my personal opinion, it's very user friendly. I never had to look at a training manual to use Zoom. I just downloaded the app and could literally figure it out without having to um, really look at the tutorials. However, they also have a lot of great short get to the point tutorials that don't take you a whole half an hour to explain something. And they break out their tutorials um, by topic area. So if you're interested in learning how to do a Zoom room, you can go look at a six minute tutorial on just that. The first thing you wanna do is go to the website, of course, sign in, download the app on your phone. I like using my um, cell phone because it's really easy. But again, figure out what works for you. You're gonna set up your, uh, use your email, set up a password. Again, if you're setting up an organizational uh, account, make sure that you're gonna be using the email address that's associated to your organization so that if you, um, lose things or someone moves on from leadership, you don't lose uh, access to your uh, platforms. Um, if you don't have this uh, a current Zoom account, you're just gonna sign up for a free one to play around with it before paying for it because you may feel like you don't 
like the Zoom platform. Maybe you want to use Google Hangouts. Maybe you want to use WebEx. Maybe you want to use freeconferencecall.com, which also has an HD um, virtual meeting space where you can see people. Figure out what works for your chapter and your budget. Um, to host the meeting, it's really simple. You're just going to download the Zoom app. And if you see these, we try to put little screenshots here. You're going to open up your Zoom app on your desktop or on your phone. You're going to log in with your email and password. You're going to click a downward arrow, and you can literally start a meeting right there as soon as you log on or schedule a meeting. I encourage you to, if you're going to use Zoom, to download it, test it out with your board for board meetings first to make sure you get a handle on how to operate it before you start trying to host an event because um, – it can be tricky if you don't play around with it. Um, so you want to figure out how to maneuver the app before you're starting to leverage events for like hundreds of people. Um, we can go to the next slide. To schedule a meeting, you're going to open up your Zoom app. You're going to sign in. There's a schedule icon. You, you're going to click that and it's going to open up a calendar. You're literally going to set the date time. Very important tip here. When you schedule your meeting, it's going to give you the option to uh, send out an invitation. A lot of times people like to copy, cut and paste the invitation and just send the URL. But it's very important to understand that, especially if your, your, your chapter members belong in different time zones, that you want to send them the entire invitation. And so utilize the feature where you can email the invitation or you're gonna copy the entire uh, uh, invitation to the clipboard if you're gonna blast it out um, in like a newsletter or you're gonna blast it out in a text message or if you're gonna blast it out in an email. But I like to utilize the email function. What that looks like is you're gonna download all of the uh, email addresses that you want it to go to and it will send an iCalendar invite and it'll if that person accepts the meeting invitation, it gets connected to their calendar so that they get a meeting invite. Because if, like busy people like me, sometimes I may forget there's a meeting and my calendar will pop up. Hey, you have a Zoom meeting in 15 minutes. All I have to do is click the link from my phone and it'll take me directly there. Um, but again, you know, we can go in really um, in-depth detail but I think the starting point is learning how to schedule a meeting and set up a meeting. It's literally the click of a button. This will bring up your uh, schedule, your meeting calendar. So again, you have your date, your time, watch your time zones. That's very important because some of us will set up meetings in the time zones that we're in, but we forget to communicate that out because when you set up your meeting, it's gonna set up in your time zone that it defaults to based off of what GPS coordinates your computer or phone is giving us off unless you change it so just make sure that you include the um if it's a um eastern if it's pacific so that people really understand what time the meeting is actually starting um with that we well, let me see if we can go to the chat i don't know um to see if we have any other questions about setting up the meeting before we jump into the closeout and then we can just open it up for questions can you set up a Zoom so participants come into the room with their microphones off? Yes, you can. That's going to be on your meeting settings. So once you set up um, the account, and again, the higher you go in um, premium subscription, the more uh, professional control you can have over your meeting room. But yes, and I know some, if you've heard of the Zoom bombing, that's been happening in some institutions where like people are hacking your Zoom. Uh, you can do like, before you came into this room, you were in a waiting room. That's a really important function that you want to um, set up so that you can know who you're letting in the room. That way, if there's somebody on the roster that you really don't know should be in the room, you can have them sitting there until you figure out they're supposed to be there. But yes, you can have um, people muted on setup. The thing with Zoom is um, they can unmute themselves. So it's really important to continuously provide instructions before you start your meeting to let everyone know, hey, make sure you're on mute unless you're talking. And then if you're a co-host or you're a host and you notice that someone's microphone is off by going to the participants um, tab down at the bottom and you see that their microphone is off, you can turn it off for them if you're a co-host if they haven't muted themselves. So I'm going to take a quick pause there. Crystal, can I just comment on a lady's yeah. question about privacy? 
So if oh, you yes. have been reading in the news, yes, um, Zoom has been um, sort of talking about their privacy back end. And so you have to, I guess, decide two things. One is when you archive your meeting, Elaine, you can decide whether you want to push out the audio recording only, which does not show obviously pictures, et cetera, or then you can edit with video editor, which most people have in their Windows platform on their computer, um, the pieces uh, of individuals that perhaps you don't wanna show their private information. And then for those platforms that really do have robust security, um, Teams, any other like uh, Microsoft Teams, et cetera, those do have the ability to protect you a little bit more than Zoom does, but Zoom as a corporation has uh, I think two weeks ago shared that they are amping up their or ramping up their uh, security. So just be mindful, like Crystal said, do your research when you're looking at the platforms that you want to use and consider what the uh, security is on the back end. Yes, so I, we're just going to do a quick little summary here and then we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, and Janice is going to be uh, moderating that, so wait for instructions from her about how to how we're going to manage this question and answer session. But in a nutshell, we want you to just make sure that you spend time in developing your engagement strategy and executing that strategy, put it in writing. It's so much easier to manage the logistics when you have a rubric and a benchmark that you've set up in your strategy. Leverage social media anytime that you can create your digital content calendar to make sure that your touch points and your feedback and your engagement is robust and piques the interest of all members and not just one specific demographic. And then make sure that you try to um, convert your um, in-person meetings to virtual meetings so you don't have to cancel. But again, spend time figuring out what's gonna work for your chapter. And then by all means, please track your metrics so you can adjust your strategy as needed. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Janice to manage our question and answer session. Thank you so much. And don't forget to unmute yourself, Dr. Janice. Good afternoon. Thank you all for um, um, adding a lot of your questions through the chat so we were able to get through those um, as we we're going through the presentation. Um, there are a few in the chat that I'm going to try to address that weren't, but if you have additional questions, I'd ask that you raise your hand. And if you look in your chat thing, you should see under my name, you see that chat hand is raised and then we will um, select you from there and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through all the questions. Uh, one of the initial questions that came from Aria Cabot, Cabot in Dallas, how do you use grant money for virtual events? Um, basically, uh, you all have received grant money for um, uh, events that now are canceled based on COVID-19. And so, um, would ask the panel if you have recommendations on how they can um, take advantage of the grant money and still use it virtually. Yeah, I, we're gonna pitch that one to Shaz. Shaz, if you could give them some direction on that. I know an email went out, but I'll let Shaz take that question. Or Lisa. And make sure you're not on mute. Um, I'll just I'll just type the answer out. Sorry about this. Okay, so she's going to type the answer out. But essentially, what um, I'm going to give you an example of Fulbright. So we, although we are mainly virtual, we do try to leverage face-to-face -face events because although Walden University is a virtual institution, they do uh, have residencies in person because we still understand the importance of face-to-face -face contact. And so one of our events was supposed to take place in April. It was gonna be a face-to-face -face event and we, it was grant money to event. And um, we had to cancel the event. With the direction and the email, uh, the chapter um, leaders sent out, Shaz and company indicated that if we plan to uh, continue an event to make sh with the grant money to make sure that we notify uh, um, Shaz and Fulbright so that they know that we're using that grant money and to give the details and specifics on how you know what event are you converting to virtual and what is that going to look like so um, what we did was we literally just the 
face-to-face -face event, we're literally just creating it into a virtual space. And so of course, it's gonna be a little cheaper because you don't have to worry about room rental and things like that. So your costs may change, but um, you can definitely convert your face-to-face -face meeting into a virtual event if it's feasible. Um, one of the things that we like to leverage all the time, especially I know a lot of chapters do these debates and these um, like speaker presentations, but you can definitely convert like a round table event with a bunch of panelists on a certain topic into a virtual platform. Um, we do it all the time. Next question. So I, um, hi, I, um, I, I just have a, a quick answer. This is Shaz. Um, we can use um, the grant funds for giving speakers an honorarium. If you have non Fulbrighters speaking, you can't give an honorarium uh, to a Fulbrighter. Um, uh, the, the, the chapter grant from that is given to us by the Department of State. You can use your own funds. Chapters have other discretionary funds that they build over the year to uh, do whatever you like. Um, uh, but the State Department grant funds cannot be used as honorarium for Fulbrighters. You can buy a license for Zoom or whatever needs you might have, technology needs, you can pay from the chapter grant to support those. So those are two specific needs. Um, there have been some chapters asking about food, whether we can have food delivered at various uh, people's houses to have a virtual gathering. Um, I think that uh, that's like not a good use of uh, State Department funds when you can have your own glass with, with a drink in your house and a snack. So um, just keep those things in mind. Okay. Um, I don't see any raised hands, but I do see a follow-up question from Aria. Um, I understand that we have until the end of September to communicate grant money that we cannot use, but what is the new deadline by which those events need to take place? Some of our planned events like a cooking class will not have the same budget if converted to a virtual presentation. So we may not use the predicted funds, but we're not sure. Um, so they, everyone should have gotten an email about um, what needs to be done and how event funds need to be reappropriated and used by September 30th. Um, but we need to know by September 1st that you're, even if you do propose events, you need to let us know by September 1st that you're not using those funds after all. Um, September 30th is the deadline to use them. You cannot prepay for events. You cannot prepay for events beyond that deadline with those funds. Those funds should be spent. <coughs> I hope that's helpful. And, and I can reach out directly to whoever needs that answer. Okay, and that was um, Aria in Dallas again. And then um, Nils de Mol van Otterloo in Greater Los Angeles. He was addressing um, um, because the Greater Los Angeles Fulbright is a large um, area, um, how they can do better in organizing events. And Crystal, that may be something that uh, you want to address because again, Fulbright is an international chapter virtually. So you may be able to provide them some um, additional ideas other than the ones you've already um, articulated. Yeah, so I, and I saw you unmuted yourself. Did you want to add a little bit of context um, to that? Uh, no, not really. I just, uh, I just wasn't sure if maybe I was going to have to say anything, but I, I'm interested to hearing what you have to say. Thanks. Okay, great. So, yeah, so, you know, we, we spend a wide demographic and um, I think the important piece is to figure out um, what's what's going to work for you if you're talking about um, like let's just say that you have a face-to-face -face event one of the things that we like to do is to ensure that we add some type of virtual piece to it. so let's just say if we go back to normal and y'all have a face-to-face -face event and everyone can't travel to that area is there a way where you can televise what's going on 
if you're using a virtual uh, platform, we love using the record feature because we do have people who live all over the world. Sometimes our time zones conflict. And so it could be 6 a.m. If we want to do a 6, a, a 6 p.m. Eastern event, and then in London, it, you know, they're six hours ahead. They're, they're getting ready for bed. And so what we do is we utilize the record function when we host our virtual events. And when we post them to our website or we blast out the link so that people who weren't able to attend in live still get to leverage the experience of at least watching or being there. Um, if you're talking about types of events, um, it, it, I think it depends on just what, what works um, for your members. You want to, we try to, uh, because we're connected to the virtual Walden um, University, when we leverage our in-person events, we travel with the school. So that works for us. So if Walden is going to be having a residency or a graduation in Atlanta, we have our face-to-face -face event in Atlanta. If they're having something in Maryland, we try to have a face-to-face -face or event in, in Maryland and then leverage the virtual experience because we want to be able to ensure, especially if people are traveling to us, that we're not just hosting in one district um, because some members might not think it's fair. So if you have the luxury to travel around into different districts within your state, well, um, try to do that. Um, it's really good if you can partner with other chapters. That's one thing that we do. So. I am in Maryland, we're close to the national capital area, so that if we're having an event and maybe some members, uh, we're having an event in Dallas, but people in Maryland are not gonna spend their money to get a plane ticket to go to a, a, a round table event in Dallas, then we say, hey, national capital area, we wanna know what is it that you're doing so that we can connect our members who live in that state with your event. So we try to leverage partnerships with other chapters that are closer to uh, the physical area in which our members are residing in so that they can still get some of that networking and face-to-face -face experience as well. Those are just some key points that we use. Hope that was helpful. Okay, uh, Celeste Branham, Branham from Maine, uh, she wants to know what impact does your reliance upon virtual gatherings have on the chapter's ability to nurture new members? Um, did, it, did, not, did Nadia or Tom want to address that one? If not, then I'll go ahead, but I want to make sure we, you know, give you a chance to get some airtime too. Uh, I can address it if, well, part of it, if you don't mind, Crystal. Yeah, go, yeah, go. You know, Celeste, that's a really good point on uh, virtual gatherings. So like Crystal had said, we um, do virtual as well as face-to-face -face gatherings and uh, piggyback on Walden events so that we can, we have a, a captive audience, if you will. Um, the other part of that is you really do have to um, give value for what your membership needs. So for us in our strategy, we developed a um, and, and similar to other uh, universities, but we developed a readiness program. And in that readiness program, we are providing supports and um, buddy systems for our advisory who are the Fulbright, our individuals at Walden that are Fulbrighters. And so for us, we do check in quite a bit. And in our committees, we have about 15 or more individuals on each of our standing committees. And so it does, uh, allow for that participatory um, engagement piece. And then uh, many of us look at the analytics around our membership, who's being added. And Crystal does a check once a week. Um, and, and in our meetings, we talk about, are we going down? Are we moving up? Our trend is upward. And so I think uh, that conversation around engagement and bringing meaning and um, having purposeful committees is really important. Yes, thank you for Kentucky for opening your doors. If anyone would like to partner with the virtual event, uh, Kentucky is putting their email address in there. Thank you so much. And just to um, point out, one of the things that we do, we, everyone has their Fulbright uh, portal profile. And one of the things that I made sure that I did is I set up a notification that anytime a new member joins the chapter, I get an email. When I get an email that that new chapter member joined, I reach out to them, I send them an email, I say thank you for joining the chapter, I give them the link to our website, they, to our 
chapter website because we have um, information on both the Walden University internal and then the external Fulbright website that we have. And then I um, just send them uh, the link to the most recent newsletter so that they can read up on all of the events that we have. I want to encourage people to leverage the wall. I didn't realize until maybe six months in that, that we had a wall. And so when those new members join, they're probably exploring around the portal. And if you post like your newsletter on the wall, they can see that. But just reach out. And I understand it depends on how big your chapter is. You may not be able to send out a personalized email every time. But just make sure you're tracking. It. Maybe if you create a mechanism where the next 20 people join, send them an email to connect so that there is a personal connection. Because if they just join and the only time you're going to engage them is three months down the road at the event, you're kind of losing that time to build the relationship. Get them involved in a committee because they're paying, they're a paying member, they signed up. And from my experience, a lot of people just want to get to work and help. Okay. Um, I don't, are there other questions that you all have? Great. Well, we're right on time, almost two o'clock on the dot. So we'll thank you so much, Dr. Janice. Thank you all for logging in. We hope that this session was helpful. I'm going to pitch it back to Lisa and Shaz if they just want to say any closeout remarks before we log off. Thank you so much. We appreciate you for allowing us to share. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. I tell you, I've learned a lot today from everything. I, there are many things that I didn't know about. Um, and I really appreciate everyone joining us today. I know you guys are busy and have many, many things to do and you're, you're taking time to um, be part of this chapter. Training is excellent. And uh, I think this is one of the most professional presentations we've yet put together for the chapters. Uh, so thanks a lot. And Lisa, I will turn it over to you now. Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was great. Like Shaw said, I learned a lot too. So I'm really excited to utilize some of your strategies. Um, and I hope that everyone who joined also got something out of it. Please feel free to email me if you guys have any follow up questions and I can try to get back to you. Um, but thank you so much for joining. And we will be posting this webinar as a recording um, early next week. So you can look out for that as well. But other than that, thank you guys. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Yes, Hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Excellent. Good job, everyone. Thank you. Very nice.